Wonderful. And so I think I should just now uh, hand over to Isla and Peter and uh, we can hear what they've got to tell us. OK. Yeah, brilliant. Yes, thank you very much. Of course, I should have said you're from NCAR. Please excuse me. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. But unfortunately, it's on the first slide. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks for having us. Um, so this is going to be a, a joint effort between me and Peter uh, to discuss what's new in CESM3, which is currently being developed at the moment. Um, although we're really going to focus on the atmospheric component, CAM7, uh, and in particular, it's vertical resolution, because I think that's something that projects as part of this um, program are interested in, because um, that, that's something we're changing, and it, it matters a lot for gravity waves in the QBO and things. Uh, so first of all, just a kind of brief introduction to who we are. I'll hand over to Peter uh, to introduce yeah. himself. <laughs> yeah, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, before we would introduce ourselves, because um, at least me personally and the many of you in the, in the audience here, I don't really know you and you probably don't know me. Um, I'm a scientist here at NCAR. I've spent most of my career being an atmospheric model developer, so working with CAM, the Community Atmosphere Model here, which is part of CESM. Um, and my, I'm, I'm currently formally the lead of our atmospheric model development, so the one who is, is making sure we, we deliver a model uh, on, on time. In terms of my expertise, um, I worked a long time with um, numerical solvers for, for fluid flow, so dynamical dynamical course for global models, both for weather and, and climate. And more recently, I've become much more interested in uh, physics, uh, dynamics, coupling, energetics, conservation, and so on. So that's basically me in, in a minute. And I'm Isla Simpson. I'm a scientist in the climate analysis section within the Climate and Global Dynamics Lab at NCAR. And so I'm not really a model developer, but I kind of look at the model as it's being developed. So I work on climate variability and change and atmospheric dynamics and some idealized modeling aspects uh, within CESM. Um, so I'm going to kind of do the first part and then I'll hand over to Peter. Um, we're going to just give a very brief introduction to CESM for anyone who might not be familiar with it. Um, and then we're going to talk about what's going to be new in the next generation atmospheric component, CAM7. And we'll focus quite a lot on vertical resolution because we did a pretty in-depth kind of investigation into what what resolution we should have. Um, so I'll be going through that. And then I'll hand over to Peter. He'll talk about the new dynamical core and other physics changes that are happening within CAM7. So first of all, this is just very brief introduction to CESM and uh, what it is. So CSM is a community Earth system model. Uh, it's the Earth system model that's developed by NCAR in collaboration with many other researchers uh, around the world, really. Uh, but it kind of represents a long history of model development at NCAR, going back to the early days of modeling. So you, um, CSM has kind of evolved directly out of these earlier generations going back to this one in the early 1980s where kind of really the focus was just on the atmosphere uh, and then moving to the full coupled sim system and then in 2010 was the first release of CESM which the name change kind of reflects the fact that these models have moved towards really representing much broader aspects of the earth system such as ocean biogeochemistry and vegetation and things like that. So we're now now, uh, moving towards the next generation CESM3, uh, which is scheduled to be released sometime next year. Um, so why might you want to use CESM? Well, I think one of the real benefits of CESM is the complexity. It, it really has um, complexity in all of the different components. It's a, a state-of-the-art Earth system model. And there are features you can turn on as you want. For example, we have a dynamic Greenland ice sheet now. There's a ocean model with ocean biogeochemistry, a pretty complex atmosphere model, kind of a state of the art, I'd say, in terms of things like um, aerosol microphysics and things like that. And we also have a very complex land model. And there are developments underway to just kind of enhance the complexity even more and more. For example, there's a development of a fish model, um, more of how, how the fish might interact with the kind of other aspects of the ocean biogeochemistry. Uh, it's pretty widely used because it's kind of 
freely available and it's well supported. Uh, we have run a number of tutorials and then there's also kind of comprehensive users guides and there's a forum where if you're running the model, you can post questions and ha hopefully have those answered either by people at NCAR or the broader user community. Uh, we also produce a lot of simulations as well. So um, if you're kind of running experiments where you want to change something in the model, uh, we have simulations that can be used as baselines. Like we have large ensembles that we produce with each generation, and we have long pre-industrial controls. And these are all available through the Climate Data Gateway. We also have a, a lot of work going on to make idealized configurations available as well. So this enhanced complexity of all of these components up here kind of does make it challenging for users with limited resources to run the model. So we have a lot of idealized configurations available on the atmosphere side, and there's work ongoing for to make idealized configurations in the land and the ocean side as well at the moment. Uh, we also have capabilities for different resolutions. So our standard model resolution is about 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer grid boxes. Um, but there are, um, well, in CSM1 and hopefully in CSM3, there will be opportunities for global higher resolution simulations going down to 25 kilometers in the atmosphere and 10th of degree in the ocean. And there's there's also regional refinement capabilities, and so here are a couple of examples of grids that are being run right now, a regionally refined North Atlantic case and a regionally refined tropical belt case um, to explore how different resolutions might impact on things. So CESM is pretty community driven. Um, we have a number of working groups uh, that are listed here. Most of these are geared towards developing individual components, um, but there are other there is such as the Climate Variability and Change Working Group and the Earth System Prediction Working Group, and they're more about running simulations and producing large data sets that are then uh, made available to the broader research community. So when it comes to developing the individual components, uh, the working groups are really the ones that make those decisions, and that consists of both internal and external people to NCAR. Um, and then those decisions are also guided and ultimately approved by the scientific steering committee and the CSM advisory board, uh, both of which consist of external advisors to NCAR. So as I mentioned, we're currently um, developing CESM3 right now, and so there's going to be significant updates to all of the model components. For example, we have a new ocean model, um, and so these are all of the, the different components of the model, and they're all coupled together through the coupler. And here we're really going to be focusing on the app atmospheric component, and in particular, the kind of standard workhorse component of the atmosphere, which is CAM7. We do have higher top configurations and coupled chemistry configurations as well that are kind of built on top of the, the basic CAM7. So what's going to be new in CAM7? Um, well, Peter's going to go through much of this, and I won't really go through the details of this slide because he'll go through that later. Uh, what I'm going to start off with is this particular change change, which is enhancement to the vertical resolution. We're now going to have 93 levels, whereas before we had 32, and we're going to have a model top at around 80 kilometers, whereas before it was around 40 kilometers. So I'm going to just kind of go through why we made that decision uh, and the path towards that enhanced vertical resolution of CAM7. So this is our current default grids in CESM2. Um, what you're seeing here is the grid spacing on the x-axis as a function of height on the y-axis. Um, and so we have these two um, kind of primary atmospheric configurations within CSM2. There's WACM, uh, which is a high top model. Uh, this has a model top at around 140 kilometers. Uh, and so it's a, it's a very well-resolving model for the stratosphere, but it goes even higher up than that. But then CAM which is the one that we use for most climate applications like CMIP and um, the large ensembles and things, it is a pretty low top model. It had a 40 kilometer top and, and both CAM and WACM had about 1,100 meter resolution in the troposphere and lower stratosphere. Mm -hmm. So why were we motivated to change the grid of CAM? We had a number of reasons. So one is that it's really recognized now that the stratosphere plays a role in tropospheric 
variability and change. And CAM's model top here at 40 kilometers is really inadequate to represent things like stratospheric polar vortex variability or QBO and things like that. Um, it's kind of behind the times at this point compared to most other CMIP class models in terms of where the model lid height is. Um, there's a lot of work going on with CSM for initialized prediction, and we don't typically do that using in-house data assimilation. Rather, we initialize from pre-existing uh, data assimilation products like Era 5. And so for initialized prediction, you kind of want to have a good representation of the stratosphere because it's a potential source of predictability on seasonal timescales. Um, and while Wacom has a good representation of the stratosphere, the model it is so high that it's kind of difficult to initialize from existing reanalysis products because they don't go up that high. So kind of the optimum from an initialized prediction standpoint is to have a model lid that's about 80 kilometers high. So you, you can still initialize from something like era five, but you can have a good representation of the stratosphere. Um, there's also a desire to have a good representation of the QBO, the quasi-biennial oscillation of equatorial winds in the stratosphere. And while Wacom is stratosphere resolving, this grid spacing down here in the troposphere and lower stratosphere of about 1,100 meters kind of wasn't really adequate to really get a good representation of the QBO, as I'll show in a few minutes. Uh, of course, for higher horizontal resolutions, for things like the regional refinement that I showed you, or a global higher resolution, having higher vertical resolution is probably beneficial. Um, there are also motivations from the boundary layer standpoint. So our lowest model level in CSM2 is around about 50 meters. Um, and so there was a desire to lower that to somewhere more like between 10 and 20, where the Mononobikov similarity theory that is used in the boundary layer parameterizations is, or surface flux parameterizations is more valid. And then there was also a desire to enhance the boundary layer resolution to improve the representation of clouds and things like that. So here I'm gonna focus quite a lot on this motivation, the motivation to have a good representation of the quasi-biennial oscillation. So the QBO is this, um, quasi-periodic -period, uh, periodic oscillation in the zonal mean zonal winds in the equatorial stratosphere. And I'm just showing you an example. This is from one of the model simulations that I'll show you in a minute, um, the, where you see this is kind of in the lower stratosphere. This is the longitudinal average of the west to east wind average from five south to five north. And you see this back and forth between westerlies in the red and easterlies in the blue. Um, and so there are reasons to care about the QBO. One is it's a potential source of predictability given its long timescales. And in particular, there's this recent evidence that there's a connection between the QBO and the Madden-Julian oscillation or the MJO. So the MJO is this kind of intraseasonal variability in the tropical Pacific, where you have these regions of kind of deep convection, uh, these large scale structures that kind of move along from west to east and they impact on the extratropics, um, affecting things like atmospheric river activity and things. So if the QBO is impacting the MJO, and if you have the QBO represented in the model, maybe there's a potential source of predictability on kind of sub-seasonal to seasonal timescales that you could capture through this connection. Um, so this is just the... I'm gonna kind of show you this connection with the MJO that has been um, identified by other people in particular this is based on the analysis of Sun and U. So this is showing MJO filtered daily outgoing long wave radiation. So this is filtering that outgoing long wave radiation to retain only zonal wave numbers one to five and periods between 20 and 100 days. And this is the standard deviation of that filtered field. So what you see here is that there's all of this activity on the the time and spatial scales of the MJO over the um, maritime continent continent region. And what's been shown is that if you instead composite this uh, metric during westerly QBO phase, and you look at the anomalies relative to climatology, you get a reduction. And then during the easterly QBO phase, if you look at anomalies relative to climatology, you get an increase. So there is this modulation of MJO activity by the QBO, which is something that it's potentially important source of predictability on these longer timescales. 
So just a reminder that these are our current grids um, that we have with CSM2. And so the approach we took to try and figure out what resolution do we want next, as we, we first kind of stuck with the 140 kilometer top, but we ran a bunch of simulations to look at how much does the grid spacing in the troposphere and lower stratosphere affect things like the QBO and other things. I will focus on the QBO, but we did look at, at other things um, as well. But the QBO is the thing that's really the most affected. So we ran this series of grids all with 140 kilometer top, but different grid spacing, uh, ranging from 1000 meter grid spacing to 400 meter grid spacing with increments of 100 meters. And we did not change the resolution in the boundary layer here because when you change that, you have to change your tuning and all of your other kind of physics needs to be altered. Um, so we really just wanted a clean test. So we only modified the resolution above 850 hectopascals. These simulations are 20 years long and are run with prescribed SSTs. And I want to emphasize that they're also run with CAM6 physics, which is so the older generation of physics. So many things can change by the time we get to CAM7. And as Peter's going to talk about, there are many other changes going into the model. So what I show you here isn't necessarily what CAM7 looks like, um, but these are clean tests of how vertical resolution impacts things. And I do want to mention that this 500 meter case, the red one, this was previously run in a study by Rolando Garcia and Yaga Richter, and it was shown to have a good representation of the QBO. So I'm going to show you composites um, of QBO uh, at the time when the zonal winds transition from easterly to westerly. So what we're going to do here is take the, the zonal mean zonal wind in the tropics, um, take the 60 hectopascal level uh, and find the times, the months at which uh, the zonal winds transition from easterly to westerly. And then we're just going to composite around these dates, looking at um, lags relative to those dates. Um, so that's what we get. Um, so the thing of this is kind of being the life cycle of the QBO on average as you transition from easterly release to westerlies at lag zero, and we're going from minus 20 months to plus 20 months around that. Um, and so this is all of our different resolutions. And you know they all look like they have a fairly decent QBO, but there are some differences. So if you focus in on this black line here, which is the 80 hectopascal level, you can see that the era five, the reanalysis QBO here, this is our observation-based estimate, the west Easterly phase extends pretty close to that 80 hectopascal level. In the lower resolution cases, um, you can see that the westerly phase doesn't get down that far. But as you go to higher resolution, you do start to get the westerly phase extending down to somewhere close to where we see it in the reanalysis. This is a metric of the QBO amplitude. So this is the Dunkerton and Delisi QBO amplitude. So it's root two times the standard deviation of the deseasonalized monthly uh, zonal mean zonal wind. So the black line here is the observation-based estimate. And then you see the two lower resolution cases with the 1,000 and the 900 meter grid spacing. And you can see that they're lacking in amplitude of the QBO compared to the reanalysis. Uh, but as we increase the resolution, um, we see a higher amplitude of the QBO. This is the 800 meter case. And then this is the 700 meter case. Um, and 700 meters looks you know, pretty close to the observation-based estimate. Um, as you increase further, they kind of are all somewhat similar. So um, what we conclude from this is that the resolutions lower than 700 um, meters seem to be deficient in the amplitude of the QBO. Um, but what about the processes that are driving the QBO? And I, I, I forgot to mention, but I want to emphasize is that in all of these cases, we didn't change the gravity wave drag parameterizations at all. We didn't do any tuning. So um, it's really what happens if you just change the resolution. And so, of course, you could tune the gravity waves to, to improve some things, um, but you can't tune how the resolve waves are behaving, really, uh, unless you kind of indirectly affect them through the zonal mean zonal wind. So... 
Um, what I'm going to focus on now is the, the role of the resolved waves in driving the QBO. So what you're seeing here is the same composite um, around this transition from easterly to westerly. But this is the tendency of the zonal mean zonal wind due to resolved waves. It's the EP flux divergence. Um, and so what you see here, if you focus in on this kind of blue line, is that at the time where the QBO is transitioning from easterly to westerly, um, there is a, an, a westerly acceleration due to the resolved waves. So resolved waves are, um, are playing a role in driving that uh, transition from easterlies to westerlies. And um, in particular, it's Kelvin waves. You know, there are people on the, this call here that have written papers about this, about the role of the Kelvin waves in driving this transition from easterly to westerly. And so if we um, look at the low resolution case here, the 1000 meter case, you can see that it's lacking that westerly tendency due to the resolved waves um, in, in driving that transition. But as we go to higher resolution, um, that improves. And I know that I think Laura has seen this in, in other studies as well, is that um, you, you get more and more of a role for the resolved waves in driving the transition from easterlies to westerlies. And in particular, by the time you're at 500 meter resolution, um, it looks like there's a, a much bigger role uh, and it kind of extends throughout the depth of the stratosphere. They're still deficient compared to what we have in Euro 5 here, but um, that's definitely improved compared to these lower resolution cases. So that's one of the big things that really changes. It's the role of the resolved waves in the lower stratosphere and in particular in driving the QBO. Now, uh, of course, parameterized gravity waves also play an important role in driving the QBO, if not, uh, well, kind of more of an important role in the model here than the resolved waves. So I'm just showing you here the tendencies due to the parameterized gravity waves. And this is almost all non-orographic gravity wave drag. So I know that you're thinking about ways to parameterize this gravity wave drag. And so it, just to emphasize that this is definitely a very important factor in driving the QBO um, alongside the resolved waves. But what we do see is that when you go to these higher resolutions, you see kind of not as much deep red in these cases. And so it's becoming less of a gravity wave driven QBO with a relatively larger role for the resolved waves than what we have at the lower resolutions. Another thing I forgot to point out that's different is you can see that if you compare the, the easterly and the westerly phases and their duration, they're pretty similar in the low resolution cases. Whereas in the reanalysis, that's not the case. The westerly phase is shorter and then the easterly phase is longer. And as you go to higher resolutions, um, that you start to see something more like what you see in the reanalysis. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking to Rolando Garcia. He argues that this is kind of a signature of this greater role for the resolved waves in driving the QBO. Um, this is just showing you wave number frequency spectra of the vertical eddy momentum flux for waves that are symmetric about the equator at 50 hectopascals. So if you're familiar with these kind of diagrams, you'll know that this kind of diagonal line here, this is the Kelvin wave part of this wave number frequency spectra. So in the reanalysis here, what the blue is showing you an upward flux of westerly momentum by these Kelvin waves, that's really what's giving you that westerly tendency due to the resolved waves prior to the, or during the transition from easterly to westerly QBO. And this is how that varies as a function of resolution. So you see this kind of clear lack of that upward flux of westerly momentum due to these Kelvin waves in the low resolution, and it gets progressively larger as you go to the higher resolution. Uh, and this is just showing you the power spectra of the vertical velocity, um, kind of a similar metric. This is basically just the amplitude of the waves. And so again, you can see you get more and more power in these uh, Kelvin waves as you go to higher resolution. And I think um, that's really Joan and Martina and others have shown that these waves have pretty small vertical wavelengths. And so if you don't have enough vertical resolution, like in these low resolution cases, they can be kind of damped numerically. And so what we're seeing 
seeing is kind of what we expect really that as you go to a higher vertical resolution, you get more and more Kelvin wave activity and it's playing out that role in driving the QBO. Just kind of in general, there's more um, lower stratospheric resolved wave activity. So here I'm no longer compositing based on the QBO. I'm just showing you kind of the climatological wave spectra. So this is the power spectra of the symmetric vertical velocity at 50 hectopascals. So this part of the wave number frequency spectrum is the Kelvin waves. And then this is the inertia gravity waves. So this is in era five. Um, and that's how that looks as a function of resolution. So as you go to higher resolution, you get more and more wave activity in both those parts of the spectrum. Um, so we were kind of convinced by this that a, a, like a 500 meter grid spacing is probably the optimum, just because you do see that jump in the role of the resolved waves in driving the QBO. But of course, that makes the model somewhat expensive, and so we don't. We and we had other motivations for not wanting to have a 140 kilometer top, like I mentioned, the initialization from other reanalysis products. So we wanted to check: well, can we just chop our model lid height um, down to 80 kilometers to limit some of that expense and allow us to continue to do things like initialize prediction from reanalysis? Um, so, sorry, yeah, and just to summarize the what we had found before is that um, this like 500 meter resolution seemed kind of optimal. There are some degradations, which I haven't gone into, but I'd be happy to show you at the end. We seem to see some degrada degradations in the mixed Rossby gravity waves that I don't fully understand with resolution. But for the most part, things in are improved uh, with resolution in terms of resolved waves. So then we wanted to see, yeah, can we chop the model top down to 80 kilometers to kind of limit some of that expense if we decided to go to the 500 meter resolution? So what we did is just took four of those grids um, and just chopped the model um, down to 80 kilometers. So here I'm just going to show you the same thing, the QBO and the role of the resolved waves in those 80 kilometer simulations. So recall that um, we were interested in this feature here, the role of the resolved waves in driving that uh, transition from easterlies to westerlies. This is the reanalysis. And then these are our, our 80 kilometer top cases. And, and these look pretty similar to what we saw in the 140 kilometer top case. We see the same dependence of the wave driving on resolution, more um, role of the resolved waves at 500 meters. And the QBO isn't significantly affected by lowering the model top to 80 kilometers. And I won't show it here, but we've checked other things like the stratospheric polar vortex variability and climatology, and they all still kind of look good with the 80 kilometer top. So we were fairly confident that we could reasonably place our model lid height there. Um, although we do have to make sure that we dump the gravity wave drag momentum at that model top um, to get a reasonable climatology. One other test we did was just to see, can we push the resolution even further? There. Um, so, so we we decided to take do a few tests where we degraded the resolution out to six kilometers at the model top, and we varied the height at which we did that. Um, and when you do that, you you definitely see some degradations in the QBO if you taper off the resolution too quickly. So this is the amplitude of the QBO in those three cases, and you can see that the kind of purple colored one is looking good. But um, if you lower the resolution Solution too quickly in the lower stratosphere, like in the beige and the kind of salmon colored one, you can see that the amplitude of the QBO um, degrades a lot. So we can't, you kind of need to have that resolution extending up into the mid stratosphere for its effects to um, still be there. So here I'm now just going to summarize the final grid that we ended up um, going with. So recall these are our two current grids in CSM2. And this is um, the final grid for CAM7 that we've decided on. So um, we have gone for the 500 meter resolution in the troposphere and lower stratosphere. Um, we taper that off to about half a scale height, 3.5 kilometers. 
and then we retain that up to the model top, except for the last couple of layers where, which are within the sponge layer anyway. And the reason we did that is that we Wacom is going to build on top of this grid and they like to have that 3.5 kilometer resolution. Um, we also have a low top configuration for those who don't want the expense of that mid top one and don't care about things like the QBO and that or, or other aspects of the stratosphere really. So that still has the 40 kilometer top. It has the same 500 meter grid spacing, but it tapers off much lower down. Um, we also, and I haven't really gone into the details here, but we have um, this enhanced resolution in the boundary layer um, as well, which, which looks like that. But like I said, when you change that, you have to change everything, your, all your physics tuning and things. So that was not included in any of the tests that I just showed you. Um, so overall, our mid-top model has 93 levels and our low-top model has 58 levels. And those can be compared with our, our current version of CAM, which has only 32 levels. Um, I just want to mention some simulations that will be becoming available soon with a kind of intermediate version of the grid. So what we've done is run some simulations with this new grid, but without changing the boundary layer. Like I said, if you if you change the resolution low down, you have to change other aspects of the model. In these simulations that I'll describe, we're just changing the free tropospheric and stratospheric resolution. Um, so we're going to have, and this is all being done with the old version of the model. So it's kind of a clean test of how does changing the vertical resolution impact on things. So we're going to have a, a pre-industrial control, uh, three-member historical to um, SSP370 coupled ensemble, and three AMIP simulations. And then there are also various AMIPs done with nudging of the QBO um, for as part of the QBO intercomparison project. And we should make these data available as soon as the, the paper's been submitted that's describing them. And there's also a project going on in collaboration with the Center for Western Weather and Water at Scripps um, to run a suite of initialized predictions with this vertical grid. Um, so <clears throat> this is very comparable to a set of initialized predictions that we have with the low top model so they can be compared. So there's going to be three uh, initialization dates and these are six month predictions going from 1979 to 2020. And I'll just finish up by showing you a very kind of quick result from those initialized predictions. So what I'm showing you here is the skill of the QBO winds. So this is zonal mean zonal wind average from five south to five north. Um, and you're seeing the mean squared skill score. So the red Red colors here are good. One is like perfect. And so this is the scale as a function of lead time over a six month period. This is in the, the low top version of CESM. And so you have some skill in the equatorial winds in the lower stratosphere. They just kind of persist for, for some time. But if we compare that with the, the new grid minus the boundary layer changes, you see that as you might expect, you have much better skill and re you can kind of hold on to the QBO um, and its evolution much better than in the low top model. And so at the beginning, I kind of mentioned this motivation that we want to be able to capture this connection between the QBO and the MJO that you see in observations. And so I'm just showing you that this is the era five composites of the MJO metric for westerly QBO, easterly QBO, and the difference between them. Uh, this is what we had in our low top model, um, which doesn't hold on to the QBO that well. And of course, we're not capturing the connection there. Um, and unfortunately, this is what we have in the high top model. And we're still not really capturing that connection at all with the MJO. So we have one of the pieces there now where like we we're representing the QBO. You might hope that maybe that would lead us to represent this connection. But there's clearly more to understand and more improvements are needed to try and capture this connection with the MJO. Um, so I'll hand it over to Peter now, who's going to talk more about all the other changes uh, that are coming into CAM. Alrighty, we're at 36 minutes, so if the moderators need to cut me off, no, please do so. I think I'll go a little over time. Okay, I'm getting thumbs up. <laughs> so I'm going to show two slides here with, with arrows, where each arrow represents uh, what's new uh, 
in CAM 7 compared to, to CAM 6. So I just went over the vertical resolution and associated with that, there's also um, a unification in, in terms of how we run simplified chemistry um, in, in, in Wacom and, and in, in the FMT uh, setup. Um, and also in, in the sense of how we treat gravity waves where we're basically using similar uh, setups or, or nameless parameters for those. Another major change between um, CAM 6 and CAM 7 is that we have changed the dynamical core. And it's been a long time since we've changed the dynamical core. So the one we have been running for CAM 4, 5, and, and 6 is called the finite volume dynamical core. It's a rather traditional finite volume uh, numerical method discretized on, on a regular latitude uh, longitude grid. Uh, but with CAM7, we have now uh, moved to a cube sphere grid, as shown here uh, on the right. So you basically put a cube inside the, uh, the sphere and inflate it. Um, and it's based on a, on a high order go lurking method. So basically, inside each of these squares here that we call elements, we project a solution onto to a third order polynomial basis. And then we perform all our numerical operators um, on that. So if you want more details on that, I've added links here um, um, to papers and presentations as well. So now a recent uh, user group meeting uh, we had in, in February, uh, we were asked by the community to give a talk on each update uh, in CAM 7. So there's a link there to, to those presentations and you can also watch them um, on YouTube as well. Other things that are new is uh, what is called convective uh, gustiness parameterization has to have, has been put in. It, it improves our simulation of tropical waves quite significantly. Um, we have upgraded our code base for uh, microphysics. It's it's called Pumas. Again, there's a link there if you want more uh, information. But moving from the old uh, Morris and Gatlin microphysics to this Puma repository, there's also several important science changes associated with that. And there's a talk by Andrew Gettleman here summarizing that. And then our, uh, basically our boundary layer and shallow convection scheme called, called CLUB, we did use that in um, CAM6, uh, but now we're also adding prognostic momentum and other things to that uh, setup as well. We're also changing to a more modern code base for radiation. It's called RRTMGP. And then, as Isla mentioned, we have a new uh, ocean model. Um, the, the formulation of this ocean model uh, explicitly requires uh, exchanging what's called entropy fluxes between the atmosphere and, and oceans. So loosely speaking, that's the heat content of uh, water going into the ocean, such as, as, as rain and snow, and then in the other direction, uh, evaporation. Um, so that's a big change to our system to change that component as well. Um, and we will work, I should say, we're not completely done with this coupling here. Um, there's a very long paper that I wrote with many colleagues uh, a while ago on this. Um, if you want to read it, it's it's 89 pages or so, so it's, it's a rather long paper, um, but there's a lot of thought going into how, how we're coupling these components. And then last but not, not least, uh, we're working with collaborators on, on a new gravity wave drag parameterization that I will uh, return to in just a moment. So that's a summary of everything that's going in. Uh, I could talk a lot about the dynamical cores of physics dynamics coupling, which I'm more comfortable talking about than what I'm gonna actually gonna talk about because I think this would be of more interest to the group. So, um, I would like to spend a little bit of time on, on explaining some thoughts on, on how the dynamical core is, is, is coupled to physics in terms of what's called resolved and unresolved scales, and then also relates uh, to, to topography. So I'm going to start out by talking about consequences of moving from the lat long grid to these more uh, quasi-uniform grids, such as the cube sphere. Um, and then maybe highlight some issues uh, associated with that um, that relates to gravity waves. But let me first just define what I mean by resolved and, and unresolved scale. Um, so this is a slide from, from our yearly uh, workshop or tutorial uh, where we show people how to run CSM and, and, and go into detail about each component. So here's just an example of what the lat long grid would use overlay the satellite image 
of Earth. Um, and obviously, when you discretize the, the system, you have you discretize it in terms of having mean values of winds and temperature and so on in each grid sail here. So that represents the smallest scale that, that this grid can uh, resolve. Um, and I also like to highlight that that state, that mean state inside each of these boxes here, that is what we pass to physics, to the gravity wave scheme, for example, so that it can compute tendencies, subgrid scale based on that. But I would like to highlight that even though, you know, the the grid size here defines a resolution, obviously, but that's not what the trusted scale of the model is, at, at least not uh, according to linear theory and kinetic energy spectra as shown here. So if you do um, a, a total kinetic energy spectra, um, for example, of, of the winds at, at some, uh, some um, pressure level, uh, usually the model energy spectra will look something like this. On the x-axis here, we have smaller scales to the right, larger scales to the left. It will usually follow a certain slope here. Um, but then if you compare it to observations, um, usually the model will start to damp these smaller scale waves more than they're damp um, or more than they are um, in, in nature. And there's an example on that on the right hand side here where um, you can show a model run. Uh, this is pretty old, but like a half degree finite volume run where you see that um, compared to our minus three slope here, we start to tail off. Um, like this. So we know that we are not representing the smallest scales in, in the model very well. So related um, or somewhat related to that, I also want to highlight um, the changes in the representation of topography in the model. So in CAM5, uh, where we were using the lat long grid, the way we were generating topography was all based on the lat long grid and the smoothing we were doing was just lat long based, meaning we were not smoothing the same physical scale every everywhere. But when we moved to CAM6, uh, we started to do a smoothing of topography that we, that's more um, correct in our opinion, uh, where we smooth the same uh, physical uh, scale everywhere. And that shows up in the energy spectra here. So if you compare the yellow line here, this is the uh, kinetic, or not the kinetic energy, but the energy spectra of, of uh, the surf, the geopotential. Um, this was the CAM5 topography. And just going uh, from that to the new topography here, shown in, in, the, in the blue line here, we're getting rid of quite a few scale. And that's just due to uh, filtering out the same physical uh, scale. And then when you, um, I think I clipped a little too fast here. Yeah. And then um, when you then map these topographies onto the cube sphere grid, so that's the red line here and the blue line here, um, then you get rid of even more scales. And again, that's related to the fact that we're using a, a quasi uniform grid. So we have the same resolution everywhere um, in contrast to the lat long grid where the, where the resolution here or the grid cell sizes uh, increases drastically as you go to with the poles. So I just want folks to keep that in mind because um, that relates to our gravity waves parameterization because the variability below the grid scale, um, which we um, put into the SGH variable, so that's a standard deviation of, of um, the geopotential, that changes you know, when, we, when we change the filtering of uh, our topography. So what the gravity wave parameterization receives is different between these different model versions. So here's an example. Oh, here I wanted to show a couple of um, climatologies here from um, our newest model version compared to uh, older model versions. On the left here, you see the the CSM2 high top configuration called called WACAM. You have DJF in the upper row, JJA in the in, in, in the lower row, and then the middle panel. Uh, it's basically our latest and greatest CAM7 simulation with the 80 kilometer top. Uh, model and then on the right you have uh, era five uh, reanalysis and what you probably see uh, immediately if you're used to looking at these plots here is that we have you know a very very strong uh, stretch stratospheric jets in, in cam seven compared to observations and also we're not really getting that tilt that we see in, in observations 
to look into why this is, is happening. So keep in mind what I just showed about the lat long and, and, and cube sphere grid in terms of resolutions. Um, my colleague Julio Bachmeister set up a simulation where we use the variable resolution um, capability of CESM, uh, setting up a simulation where we had quarter degree resolution in both the polar regions here, and then one, degrees, uh, one degree resolution elsewhere. So on the left, uh, down here in the lower row, you see the, the CSM2 finite volume, Wacom uh, simulations. And then here is the other results for this dual polar grid where we have higher resolution in the polar regions. And there you see we're starting to get the tilt uh, that we're seeing in, in observations. And we also slow down the wind significantly compared to uh, our one degree simulations that are shown on the right here. So. Definitely the higher resolution up here is picking up on something that um, the one degree model is not picking up on and that we haven't parameterized in, in the one degree model. So in this plot here is, um, is an animation of uh, the vertical velocity. I think it's at 18 kilometers. I don't know how to right click on this mouse. Oh, there we go. Make it loop. There we go. Um, so that's with the dual polar grid, and, and, and what you see is, you, you what we think we're seeing here is, you, know, you definitely see gravity waves propagating off uh, topography and so on, but also down here around the Southern Ocean, um, you do see a lot of gravity wave activity that's probably not related to um, orographically forced uh, gravity waves. Um, so that had less, let, let uh, Julio Bachmeister and Martina and Joan that are, that are on this call to think about um, parameterize a possible mi uh, missing process in our system. They call it moving mountains parameterization. Um, I, don't want, I don't want to go into great detail here, but it, it, it keys off, you know, parameterize the momentum fluxes from our, our bond, boundary layer scheme and then launches a slow phase speed um, gravity waves from, from that. And if we include that in our models, this is the same plot as I showed on, on previous slide here, but now in the middle here, this is the one where we include this new candidate parameterization for, for CAM7. And now you see that we're starting to get some of this tilt in the southern, southern hemisphere, and we're also slowing down um, the winds. So I think I won't slow show the next couple of slides. I just wanted to make just a general statement here. So uh, I just wanted people to get the sense of, you know, we don't really understand the, the interaction between the unresolved and results grid scales in terms of this gray area where we know that the dynamical core does not represent the scales uh, very well. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity here to use high resolution simulations to, for example, train a machine learning algorithms so kind of pissing, picking up on these missing processes that we're currently not parameterizing um, in the model. So I'll stop here so that we will have um, 10 minutes for uh, a discussion. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Peter and Isla. That was, that was really, uh, really interesting. So questions, comments, applause from Dominic, at least. 